I believe the direction that we're going to go today, we're going to, we're going to zero in on somebody in the scripture that you've probably heard of before. But I believe he had that same mindset. I believe, I believe while David was this ruddy old shepherd boy, the youngest of his brothers, I believe he had seen victories along the way, but I, I just have this feeling that inside of David's heart, he knew that there was a bigger victory on its way. And so he was thankful for all that God had done in his life, but he knew that every time that he would be on this back backside of a desert somewhere and he'd be watching these few little sheep. And the Bible goes on to, to tell us that, that when a lion or when a bear would come and it would grab hold of one of these sheep, that David would go and grab the sheep and take it out of the, the jaws of the lion or the bear. And I believe every time that happened, I just have to imagine that David, this little shepherd boy would thank God, God, thank you for this victory. But he knew that it was only in preparation for the Goliath that he would one day face. And there was going to be a greater victory down the road. And I believe the same thing can be said of Elevate Life Church. God has done some awesome things, but there is still more to receive. There are still victories to be had. And so now we find ourselves picking up in this infamous scripture in 1 Samuel chapter 17. I wanna read a few verses to you. If you've got your Bibles, I want you to go ahead and open them up, 1 Samuel 17, 32 to 34. If not, we got it on the screen. Now it says this, it says, David began to speak to Saul and he said, don't worry about this Philistine. Don't worry about Goliath. He said, I'll go fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. I wanna read those three words one more time. Don't be ridiculous. There's no way that you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You are only a boy. And he's been a man of war since his youth, but David persisted. We don't have time to go into it, but there is a passage of scripture in the book of Acts that actually gives us insight to how God actually viewed David. The Bible says that God said, I found a man after my own heart. I find it interesting that in this passage, we see that Saul called David a boy, yet God saw him as a man. Here, here's what I found in my life, that many times the enemy will throw people in your way that wanna put a label over you that's contrary to the way that God sees you. In, in fact, I would actually tell you this, you have to be careful who, who you allow to write a narrative over your life when God never gave them the pen. God's the one that's writing. He is the author of your story. God is the one who has a purpose and a destiny for you. And here's what I love about God. When God has a purpose and a destiny in your life, he will actually put something inside of you that actually looks ridiculous to everybody else that's watching your life. And so I love simple stories like this. I love the age old truths of stories like David and Goliath. As if you're anything like me and you are, you were raised in church, maybe some of you were not, but the, for those of you that have been raised in church, you've probably heard this story more times than you can even count. And see, for me, I, I grew up in the nursery and I grew up in children's church. Like we didn't have all these fancy terms like e-kids, we just had children's church. Like you were a child and you were going to church and so you went to children's church. And see, for me, I grew up out in McClenny where our location is and I had a children's church teacher and her name was Tarina Stair. Now, if that name sounds familiar, the last name is because it's the aunt of our pastor, Pastor Tim Stair. And in our children's church, she would begin to teach us the age old truths about the Bible. And there would be stories, and y'all don't know nothing about this, but when I was growing up, we had something called a felt board. And then she, Miss Tarina would actually grab the characters and she would tell us about David and she would tell us about Goliath and she would grab these characters, and she would slap them up on the felt board and begin to show us how God can do miracles through somebody like David. But can I just tell you, I wanna caution you, I think the danger of these common stories is that they become too common to us. Because one of the greatest detriments to God giving us fresh insight is for us to just be too familiar. And see, God wants to give us something new, something fresh out of this story. I believe it's the, same, it's the same concept when Jesus in the gospels, he was doing his ministry and the Bible says he went back to his hometown. And when he went back to his hometown, he could do all these miracles everywhere else. But when he got to his hometown, the Bible says everybody knew who he was, therefore did not honor Jesus. And Jesus says only in his hometown is a prophet without honor. 
Here's the scary part. Jesus could only do a few miracles. I believe the same concept applies to our scripture. I believe if we come to a text, we come to a story like this, and we don't honor what God is trying to tell us, we will miss out on the miracle that he's trying to show us. And the miracle of the story is the theme of everything that we're going to we're gonna talk about today. Here is, here is the miracle of the story. God's miraculous is always tied to our ridiculous. God's miraculous is tied to our ridiculous. I'm thankful that we are at a church that's not afraid to err on the side of being ridiculous. Come on, y'all don't wanna amen me down on this, but y'all know it's true. Like, you want me to join a serve team? Every time I turn around, my locations pastor's asking me to go to explore, asking me to sign up for a serve team. Come on, it's just a little ridiculous. Like, you want me to stand out in the parking lot and park people in the summer in Florida when they can just park themselves? Come on, it's a little ridiculous. You want me to, you want me to serve in e-kids? Come on, now, now you're really being ridiculous. Hey, that's, that's my free childcare for the week. I ain't going to eat kids. Y'all being ridiculous. What about this? When y'all want to launch a location, y'all do it in a middle school, a Baker County middle school? Come on, that's ridiculous. You mean y'all got to set up every week and you got to tear down right when the service is over? You got to have explore in a cafeteria that smells like meatloaf from 1996? Come on, that's ridiculous. But can I just tell you, I wanna admit something to you. I think every bit of that's ridiculous. But here's what I know. If we will just do the ridiculous, God will show up and do the miraculous. And that's what we've seen happening in all of our locations that God says, if you will do what you can do, I'll show up and do what you cannot do. God's miraculous is tied to our ridiculous. I love this story. Because for it to end so epic, it starts so normal. You can't can't convince me that David woke up that morning and looked himself in the mirror and put on war paint and said, this is the day that I'm gonna defeat Goliath. I I think it it was just an ordinary day. But because he obeyed his father and he took meat and cheese to his brothers. Come on, hey, listen, he took bread and then he took cheese. Listen, that's what pizza is. He was just a pizza delivery boy. Listen, I, I, think, I think David was just wanting to clock in and clock out of Pizza Hut and be like, I'm going home. And listen, he obeyed his dad and he took the bread and he took the cheese and because he was in the right place at the right time, he now finds himself looking over the valley of Elah and he hears this murderous threats from a Goliath, from a giant. I believe that it's imperative that we find ourselves at the right place at the right time. But for however good it is to be at the right place at the right time, I believe that it's equally detrimental to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. I remember in January of 2020, we had a, a tragic event happen in my family. My, I got a call on a Wednesday afternoon that my, that my papa, that my dad's dad had passed away, he had a stroke and passed away. And it hit home really, um, because it, was, it made it even worse and the, the pain was uh, stung even a little bit more because it was really the first death that we had experienced that close uh, to home in, in our family. And so my papa ended up passing away. And on the Friday, uh, they had the viewing service and the, the next morning on Saturday was gonna be the, the funeral service. And so Friday evening, uh, we went to a small little funeral home in Baldwin. Now, if y'all don't know where McClinney is, you probably don't know where Baldwin is, okay? But it's right before you get to McClinney. And we had this viewing on the Friday night. And as I walked in, I saw people I had not seen in years. Some I have never seen before. And as we began looking around, all of our family was there except my brother. And all of us family, we began talking to each other. We're like, hey, where's where's Josh? Like, where's Josh at? Now, here's what you gotta understand about Josh because I think everybody's got a Josh in their family. Josh is gonna be late no matter what the event is, no matter where he goes. Listen, he'll always look good. He'll always be dressed right, but he's gonna be fashionably late. Come on, how many of you know somebody that's always late no matter what the situation? Come on, y'all don't be, y'all don't be talking about somebody that's sitting right there next to you. Don't raise your hand if they're sitting right there next to you. 
My brother's always late. And so we're like, okay, what's going on? We gave it a few minutes. Finally, I called my brother. I'm like, Josh, where you at? And he's like, I, I didn't know that there was more than one funeral home in Baldwin. Now I'm talking about being at the wrong place at the wrong time. And so my brother ends up going to the other funeral home in Baldwin. It just so happened that there was a viewing going on the same night. And so my brother walks in and he sees people and he thought exactly what I thought. He's like, man, I hadn't seen these people in forever. He's like, I don't think I've ever seen you. He's like, they must be from out of town. He's like, well, I'm gonna go ahead and just pay my respects to my, to my papa. And he said he started to go down the middle aisle and as he got in the middle aisle, he began to look ahead in the casket and he's like, I think my papa had hair. And then he, and then he got to the middle of the aisle have y'all ever been in a situation where you're just too far invested? <laughs> and it's like, I just got to own this thing. At this point, he knew, like, I'm at the wrong place. This is not my papa. And, and I'm like, Josh, what in the world did you do? He's like, I just had to own it. And so he said, I was in the middle. And he said, I felt every eye looking at me. They're like, who is this guy that's walking into the viewing? You, nobody knew who Josh was. And he said, I knew it. And I just had to own it. And he said, I just walked to the front, to the casket. I'm like, Josh, what'd you do? He said, I just put my hand on the casket. He said, Papa, I love you. And he said he ran out, gave me a call. He's like, where in the world is the right funeral home? Can I just tell you, listen, 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 listen. You gotta be careful that you are in the right place at the right time. Because it's detrimental when you find yourself at the wrong place at the wrong time. And David found himself, because of his obedience, obeying his father at the right place. And now he is overlooking this valley, the Valley of Elah. And for the next few moments, I just wanna give you three things. If you're, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. The blueprint for a ridiculous faith. The blueprint of a ridiculous faith. I wanna give you the first thing really quickly. There must be a problem. If, if you are going to have a ridiculous faith, there must be a problem that you're faced with. While I don't necessarily, necessarily believe that God creates are giants. I do believe that God allows giants because what God understands better than what we understand is that giants actually bring out the best in us. So if you ever find yourself face to face with a Goliath, it's only because there's a David inside of you. And God allowed this giant to stand on the other side of the valley. You know, you know Goliath was actually, if you study it out, Goliath was nine feet, nine inches. He was he was the epitome of what a giant would be. He had been a man of war from his youth. Every single day for 40 days, day and night, he would come out and he would begin to taunt David and his brothers. 40 actually representing the number of testing or trial or problems. It, it doesn't take a rocket scientist, it doesn't take a Bible scholar to understand that David had a problem on his hands. And see, here, here's how you know you have a problem is when you size it up, you just realize, man, this is too big for me. Listen, my problem might be, might be different than your problem. And your problem might be different than your neighbor's problem, but here's what all problems have in common. They are too big for us to handle. But can I just tell you the good news? Giant killers are always born in the face of problems. If you never have a giant, you never need a ridiculous faith. I believe this is why Psalms 46 actually says this. It says that I, God, am an ever-present help in trouble. An ever-present help in problems. If God is present in our problems, then can I just tell you this? We cannot run away from our problems because if we do, we actually run away from God because God finds himself in the middle of our problems. This is why Paul, I, I actually believe Paul cracked the code because he actually said it like this. He said, most gladly, therefore, I would rather glory in my weakness or I would rather glory in my problem that the power of Christ may rest on me. Paul understood this principle that if there is a problem standing in front of me, that can only mean that God's hand is resting on me. And Paul finds himself in all of these perplexing situations and he says, I'd rather glory in my problems. Jesus takes it another step further and he says, in this life, you will have trouble. You will have problems. But take heart, 
because I've overcome the world. I want, you to, I want you to stay with me for just a moment because I believe that God showed me something as I was preparing for this. You know, the actual word trouble, Jesus says, in this life, you will have trouble. The actual word that Jesus used was not trouble. It was actually the word pressure. In this life, you will have pressure. The, that exact word actually paints the picture of a wine press. It's the squeezing of the grapes and that extracts the juice and creates the wine. In this life, you will have pressure. You know, as we read the story of David and Goliath, if you go on to read the whole chapter, you'll find that Goliath was from a place called Gath. It's actually the word where we get Gethsemane, where Jesus had so much pressure where he literally began to sweat great drops of blood. Gath actually means wine press. Why do I I tell you all this? Because I believe that some of you are sitting here today and you're thinking, Dusty, this is good. Like this is a good word that God gave you. I just don't know how it applies to my life. I don't even know what the giants are in my life. Here's how you identify your giant. Your giant will always be born out of the place of your greatest pressure. What is the thing that's bringing you pressure in this life? There, there is medical pressure, there is relationship pressure, there is spiritual pressure, there is financial pressure, but take heart. Jesus says, I have overcome it. The first thing, if you were taking notes, I want you to write it down. The blueprint of a ridiculous faith, there must be a problem. The second thing is this, you must be persistent. I I love this story right where we picked up in these few verses because we see this exchange, this dialogue between David and Saul. And Saul says, don't be ridiculous. And then the end of the text says, but David persisted. I, I believe that God has a special place in his heart for those that are willing to be persistent. I believe that God has a special place in his heart for those that are willing to be persistent, even if it means looking ridiculous. And David was persistent and didn't give up, even in the face of adversity. Chuck Swindoll says this. He says, life is 10% of what happens to you, 90% of how you respond. I think if we were to put that in, in our world, we could phrase it like this. Life is 10% what giants are in front of you, but 90% of how you attack those giants. Listen, I've been, I'm 32 years old, And I still consider myself young, but I've had the opportunity, the pleasure of being in ministry now for a while. I got started, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, I got started at at a young age. And so I've been in ministry for about 13 years. And throughout the 13 years of being in ministry, um, I've had uh, the privilege of walking through some amazing moments in people's lives. But I've also had the responsibility of walking through tragedy in people's lives. And oftentimes when people have walked through tragedy or maybe loss or uh, maybe someone in their family lost their life, I've given this piece of advice to many different people. I tell them the weight of this will never get lighter, but you will get stronger. Can 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 I just tell you for just a moment, in a span of three and a half years of my life, starting in 2018, I felt like there was tragedy after tragedy after tragedy that I had faced. Started in 2018 when I got call, a call from, from our son, our oldest son's doctor. I can tell you the exact restaurant that I was sitting in when my wife got the call. And we found out that, that our oldest son had severe brain damage and was diagnosed with cerebral palsy. And on that call, I remember the doctor saying, I've seen some minor cases and I've seen some severe cases. I just wanna give you a heads up that what your son is dealing with is an extremely severe case. And obviously through the years we've had to navigate through Brave's health journey. But then not too long after that, as I alluded to earlier, I got a call in January of 2020 that my papa had passed away from, from a stroke. And then the very next year, we found out that my father-in-law drove a bus for us. I, I, I was a youth pastor at, at another church and we would always go on these youth events over the summer. And my father-in-law drove the bus for a youth trip. And that was the end of April. By the end of May, he had passed away from COVID. 
And it just felt like in a season of my life, there was tragedy after tragedy after tragedy. And can I just tell you this? Like the, the weight of all of that never gets lighter. But I tell you what does happen. As I persistently continue to lift that weight up to Jesus, I continue to get stronger. Because I've just gotta be persistent. I gotta keep giving it to him. Not too long ago, a guy came up to me and he said, he said, Dusty, listen, I've tried and I've given everything I've, I've had to Jesus. I've been a part of a freedom small group. I went to the freedom conference and I feel like uh, everything has been crashing in my life ever since. And he says, I've been struggling to even come to church, struggling in my faith. And you know, I looked him in the eyes and, I, and it probably wasn't the most spiritual advice, but you know what I told him? I said, sometimes even when you don't feel like it, you just gotta put one foot in front of the other. The, Bi the, Bible, the Bible says this, when you've done all that you can to stand, just stand, just stand, just keep, just keep coming to church. Even if you don't even, even if you don't feel like coming to church, you just drag yourself to church. Even if you don't feel like going to a small group, you just drag yourself to a small group because you've gotta be persistent. God, I'm gonna continue to give this to you. That's why Jesus says, ask, seek, knock. You know what that actually, it actually implies continued action. Ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking, knock and keep on knocking. And God says, I'll open up the door, you will find me. About two months ago, I got a call from a friend and he said, Dusty, hey, I'm, I'm about to go fishing. I'm about to take my boat out, do you wanna go? And I said, yeah, I wanna go. And I'd actually been telling my wife, like, I'm like, hey, uh, I wanna go fishing. I haven't been fishing in a while. And I just get this random call from one of my friends and he says, hey, I'm taking the boat out. We're gonna go deep sea fishing. And I'm like, sign me up, let's do it. Tell me what time. He's like, we're leaving out of St. Augustine. And before I hung up, I'm like, hey, how far, how, how far out are we going? You know, it just kind of hit me. I'm like, I better ask that question. He's like, we're, we're gonna go 65 miles out. And I'm like, hmm, I don't know about that. <laughs> like, I trust God here, but like, man, that's putting some, my faith to the test. And so we got in the boat and I said, yes. And we go out and we get 65 miles out. And we're like, hey, we better start, we better start coming back. And so it, started, it was evening and the sun started setting. And as we were coming back in, we were now about 40 miles out and we had engine failure and the boat just brrr. Listen, you don't ever wanna hear brrr when you are 40 <laughs> miles out. And listen, I don't know and I respect whatever your upbringing is, but I'm just gonna tell you what my upbringing is. Like we believe in the laying on of hands. And 99% of the time that's laying hands on people. But there's 1% of the time where you go to the back of the boat and you lay hands on the motor. And I found myself 40 miles out and I'm like, God, I'm asking and I'm seeking and I'm knocking. And I began praying over the motors of this boat. And listen, we, we, we keep gum, coming in and we, one motor is totally gone at this point. And so we are maxing out at about 10 miles an hour. And so we, we end up trying to radio in. We try to get towed back in. We can't get nobody. Guys, this happened about two months ago. And I was scared to tell Pastor Tim for a while because it got really close to them looking for another location, Pastor Al McClay. <laughs> and, um, and so we radio in and we try to get the Coast Guard. And finally we get the Coast Guard. Like, this is a big deal, y'all. Like, the Coast Guard's involved. And so we finally get a hold of them. We tell them what's happening. And so an hour passes and there's no Coast Guard. And we, we try to call the Coast Guard back. We try to radio and there is no response. We can't get nobody. Hour and a half passes, can't get nobody. Man, we keep calling and we keep calling. We all huddle together and we're like, hey guys, we're all on the same page here. Nobody's telling our spouses. No, our wives never know about this because we are never fishing again. It got about 9.30 and we're like, yeah, we better go ahead and tell our spouses. And so he has this special device where it's able to use satellite and he texts. The guy who owned the boat texts his wife. He said, listen, we're okay, um, but we are, we are 40 miles out and we're having problems. And finally, we get the message back from his wife, and she's like, listen, we're all praying back here. Uh, my friend who owned the boat, he's a firefighter. His fire chief ended up finding out. I'm like, what in the world is going on? And so I'm praying, and we keep calling the Coast Guard, and we're calling and calling. And finally, we get a text back from my friend's wife, and they said, listen, the Coast Guard is almost to you. They said, just because, listen, they said, they said I know that you haven't been able to hear them, but they've heard you the whole time. Listen to me, listen to me. Here's what I began to find out in this moment, because y'all know this, preachers will preach on anything. 
And here, I'm like, if I ever get back, God, I'm using this for you. Just get me back safe. And, I, and so here I am using it for him. And here's what I begin to find out. Here's, here's the thing about being persistent. Just because I didn't hear them replying did not mean they were not responding. Let me tell you this. Listen, listen. Why do I tell you to be persistent? Because some of you have cried, you have prayed, you have knocked, you asked, you have, you, you're seeking after God, and you're like, it's like he's nowhere to be found. But can I just tell you this? You may not hear him, but that doesn't mean he's not responding. God's still responding to your life. Here's the last thing. Here's the last thing. I gotta hurry. Write this down. It's okay to be ridiculous. I want you to write this down. Third point, third point. God must have a promise. So if there must be a problem, and you must be persistent, it can only mean one thing, that God must have a promise. God will never send you into a battle without a promise being on the other side. David, standing on the other side of the valley of Elah with his brothers, and he said, I'm tired of this. He said, if y'all ain't gonna fight him, I'll go fight him. And I love the part of the story because he's asking everybody around him. He said, hey, listen, if I beat that guy over there, what do I get? In other words, is there a reward? Is there a promise on the other side of this battle? They said, yeah, if you, if you beat that giant over there, you get to marry the king's daughter, you get riches, and you won't get taxed. That's the jackpot for a single guy, by the way, okay? <laughs> he said, I'll go fight him. And he starts getting everything together and he starts getting ready. And you go read the scripture yourself. The Bible says this, it says now a second time, right before he went into battle, he said, hey, 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 I'm gonna go fight him, but if I fight him, what do I get? What is the promise? They said, you already know what the promise is. They said, you'll, you'll get to marry the king's daughter, you'll get, rich, get riches and you won't be taxed. He's like, cool, I got you. I'll go fight him. A third time, he said, hey, if I fight him, what do I get? Three different times he asked, and every time the answer was the same. You wanna know what I believe David understood? In the heat of the battle, you always have to keep your mind on the promise. Because if you don't, you'll give up. When you find yourself facing the Goliaths in this life, you gotta keep your eyes on the promise. A few more moments that I have with you. I mentioned to you that our oldest son, He's been diagnosed with cerebral palsy. One side of his brain is completely, just completely damaged. And so he's been going through some serious surgeries. Last year had two major surgeries and just had another major surgery about a month ago. And every now and then when he goes through surgery, I'll get people that mean really well. And they'll ask questions like, well, what is this surgery gonna do? Does this mean that, that he's gonna be able to walk? And my, my typical response every time I get a question like that is, well, the doctors, don't, the doctors don't give those kind of promises. You wanna know what gets me through this life? It's not, it's not that I'm stronger than anybody else. It's not that I don't hurt like anybody else. It's not like I don't have tears like anybody else. But you wanna know what gets me through this life is I know that there is a life after this life there is a promise after this struggle, after this life. And can I tell you this? That life is called heaven. And when brave gets to heaven, God has all eternity to make it up to him. There is a promise past this pain, past this struggle. David, as just a boy, fights this, this Goliath. And then he was ushered into being a king. And many scholars believe at the end of his kingship, he began to pen probably the most famous Psalm, Psalms 23. And I love it because he begins to, begins to write. And I don't know how you read the Bible, but sometimes I just read the Bible and I just, I get this imagination of like, what was David feeling when he wrote Psalms 23? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not. And he began to go down. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And all, he began to write all of this stuff down. And I just can't help but think, David, when he got to the part, he was about to talk about the valley. And I just, I just have to think that he took the pen and he dropped it. And before he said, even though I walk through the valley, 
I think his mind went back to another valley, the valley of Elah, the valley where the murderous threats of his Goliath would just echo. And he began to think, God, if you got me out that time, God, you'll be able to get me out again. God, if you could get me out of that valley, if you could help me defeat that battle, then every other valley and every other battle that I face, God, you're gonna be able to get me to the other side. But can I tell you what the ultimate promise is? Is that your valley and your battle and your struggle actually brings you closer to Jesus. Can I prove it to you? I want you to throw that scripture up on the screen really quickly. Look at what David said. Looking back over his life, he said, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for who? You are with me. Notice this, before he walked through the valley of the shadow of death, he referred to God as he. Almost like he was in the back of the room, almost like he was some distant figure. But after he walked through the valley, he no longer said, he is with me. He said, you are right here. You are with me. Because there's something about the valleys of this life that takes him from being there to right here. And now he's by your side. And listen, that's why God wants you to understand, I have a promise for your life. And if nothing else, the promise is this, that I will draw closer to you even in the moments of hurt, even in the moments of pain. I wanna pray with you. And if you can, I just want you to close your eyes. Come on, nobody look around. I feel like there's some people in here today that your battle, that your Goliath, your struggle, it might be medical, it might be relational, it might be, it might be spiritual. Your Goliath might just be unbelief. And I wanna speak to you for just a second. That Goliath of unbelief has a promise on the other side. And that promise is salvation, is Jesus. I want you to look at your life and be honest and say, man, it's today the day that I need to look across the valley and look at that Goliath of unbelief and say, today's the day. God, I wanna believe in you. God, I wanna surrender my life to you. If that's you, I wanna pray for you. Father, we thank you. God, we thank you for this moment. God, we thank you that you're so good. Lord, we thank you that even during our heartache, in our pain and our trouble, you are an ever present help. And God, the reason why we can have hope and the reason why we can be persistent in the struggles of this life is because we know that you are the promise on the other side. So God, I pray for anybody that might be ready to take that leap and take that step and surrender their life to you, be with them. And God, I pray for every other person Maybe they are struggling with something in their family or their home or their marriage or their child or whatever it may be. God, I pray for your strength to come alongside them and you no longer be he in the distance, but you are now you beside us. We thank you for it in Jesus' name.